teaching us this evening. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah for just a moment. Nehemiah chapter 11, and uh, really we'll be moving into chapter 12 tonight. We've been in a series through this incredible book of Nehemiah, and uh, over really the period of almost a year uh, on Sunday nights with uh, various other activities that come along that kind of disrupted our flow. But nevertheless, we are uh, coming to the last few chapters in the book of Nehemiah. And in fact, this past Monday, we had a, uh, a great group of folks that uh, gathered from across the South Yadkin Baptist Association and some folks from here at Trinity that uh, were part of the Nehemiah Initiative. And um, that, that gentleman, Dr. Steve Sells, covered the whole book in about six hours. So um, I'll tell you, put me to shame when it's taken me six months to get through 11, 11 chapters. And, uh, but anyway, tonight we, we want to pick up in the 11th chapter and stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of the Word of God. It says, Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. These are the heads of the provinces who dwelt at Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession in their cities, Israelites, priests, Levites, Nathanim, and descendants of Solomon's servants. And also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and of the children of Benjamin. And then you see a long list of names that begins from that point all the way through the 11th chapter. I will call your attention there in verse 17 where it talks about Madaniah, um, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, the leader who began the thanksgiving with prayer. Again, giving the detailed instruction all the way through. And then I'll have you turn over to the 12th chapter, if you will, and want you to see what was said in verse 43. And that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard where? Afar off all over that promised land the celebration and the noise of Jerusalem could be heard father I pray that you speak to us in these next few minutes and that Lord we would just hear your voice thank you for this record that we know as the book of Nehemiah thank you for the fact that it's the the greatest book on leadership that's ever been written sacred or secular and thank you that you and Allow us tonight just to be able to, to study just a portion of your word, asking that you would apply it to our lives, asking that you would help us to see the big picture, asking that you would just touch our hearts and draw us to yourself. And Lord, I just thank you for the privilege of, of all of us being able to gather together in your name this very evening. And I pray personally that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, let them be pleasing in your sight. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we move through Nehemiah, it's been fascinating to me, I hope to you, to watch how God has used this book to speak right to the heart of the local church in America in 2022. It's interesting if you think where we've been so far. You notice we've experienced where the walls and the gates of the city were restored. They, they've been in a time of worship. We've already seen that back in chapter 8 when the Word of God was presented to them. You noticed in the chapters, we went through chapter 8 and 9, that the people have repented by this point. 
Not only have they repented, but the Bible says the people have wept. In fact, before we finished chapter 8 and 9, we noticed that they'd moved beyond the emotion and they actually had taken action. They had signed a covenant that they had entered into in those previous chapters. And by the time we got to the end of chapter 10, we found the people had created this covenant with the Lord and literally signed their name. They had written down what they were committed to. You see, they understood that talk's cheap. They understood that a lot of people say a lot of stuff. And they understood that they needed to put their names down on a written document of what they were committed to and what they had said to the good Lord they were going to do. And then we come to chapter 11 where we are tonight. And Nehemiah does what? He calls on the people to present three sacrifices to the Lord for the sake of this city. Now just think about that for a minute. For the sake of their city, they're being called to make three very, very important sacrifices. I say for the sake of the city because if you remember how they got here, it was in 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar and his troops had marched in and had flattened the city. As I've been watching the pictures over the last two weeks of Ukraine, and I've watched those cities literally be bombed into nothing. To see those apartment buildings that are just dust and completely burned out. To see the inhabitable environment that is being created in city after city after the Russian invasion. I look at those and I imagine how the people of Jerusalem had felt because when Nebuchadnezzar and his troops came in, they had flattened the city. And part of flattening that city is they had taken the walls down all around that city. And with the walls torn down, thieves and foreign invaders made it common practice to come in and out at will and to rape and to pillage the land. Just like you're seeing on the news. Every day, coming in, invading. In Jerusalem's case, for 142 years, these people lived like that. For 142 years, those walls were flattened. Oh, don't get me wrong. There were plenty of town halls. There was plenty of blame being thrown from one side to the other of whose fault it was that we let this happen. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And yet, after 142 years, God moved on the heart of a man named Nehemiah. And what couldn't be accomplished in 142 years, get this, got done in 52 days. The big difference? God was involved. God was leading. God was bringing the people together. God was raising up the leader who could see the big picture and was bringing everyone together to move and see what would happen. So there was an incredible love and commitment that these people now had for this city of Jerusalem that they've rebuilt these walls and they've heard the word of God, as I said, and they've wept. They've been moved beyond emotion. They've written down their commitments. And now in chapter 11, they're beginning to see three sacrifices that God places before his people for the sake of the city. And what's even more incredible about that is it speaks to all of us right here in Mooresville, North Carolina. You know, we're about to have a community-wide revival. In fact, two weeks from tonight, we won't be here. Two weeks from tonight, we'll be at the fairgrounds. And two weeks from tonight, we're going to participate in a revival meeting 
where churches we pray from all over Iredell County are going to come out and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed. People will be given an invitation to come and receive Christ as their Savior and Lord. But for us to be ready for that, something has to happen. For this county of Iredell to be ready for something like that, something has to happen. In fact, I believe right here in Nehemiah 11 and, and 12 that you and I can find tonight three very important things that God calls them to sacrifice. And I really believe when you begin to see these three things start happening in your life and in my life and in the lives of people around us, we're going to know that revival is beginning. The very first thing he asked for was simply this. You must give yourself to God. You must give yourself to God. Now that the walls and the gates have been rebuilt, what needed to happen? I'll tell you what needed to happen. There needed to be people that would come back and inhabit the city of Jerusalem. People had to let the population begin to grow. They needed people to live there as to protect the city. They needed people to now live there in Jerusalem who would live there as a witness to the skeptical Gentiles that were all around them. Remember what the skeptics had said? Oh, if they build those walls, even a little fox will jump up on it and the wall will come crashing down. They were skeptics. And in the midst of that skepticism, they needed people who would live out their faith as a witness to them. But most of all, they needed to come together in Jerusalem because God had brought them back together to fulfill a special plan that he had for them. In short, God desired people, living bodies, who were willing to be living sacrifices in the holy city of Jerusalem. Now, I noticed here in these first couple of verses that um, <laughs> some people volunteered willingly and some had to be drafted. Which camp do you think you would have been in? And the ones that volunteer say, sign me up, put me down. I'll take a space there in Jerusalem. Or would you have to be the one waiting for the call from Nehemiah to say, guess what? God has a wonderful plan for your life, and here's where you're going to live. Which would it have been? Well, we see here, it says in verse 1, the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. In other words, we find right here in chapter 11 that Nehemiah lists. That's what all these names are, by the way, if you just look down at them. And, and oftentimes we don't read them because we don't want to butcher them any worse than, uh, than what they are just to our sight. But when you look at that whole list that is there, the people of Judah and Benjamin are found there in verse 4 all the way down through verse 9. And, and then you'll see, and by the way, they're the priests, the Levites, the temple workers. They show up in verse 10 all the way through verse 24. And then, listen, when you get over to chapter 12, verse 1 all the way through 26, list the other temple ministers. Now, what do you notice about all those names? I'll tell you what I notice about all those names. It took a lot of people that needed to be involved in giving, 
truly themselves totally over to the Lord. For God to do what he wanted in that city, he involved an awful lot of people. That's a lot of names that are in that list. And, and, and listen, I don't know if you realize it or not, but, but you're needed in the ministry of this church. I mean, if you just think on a given Sunday morning of how many people it takes to, to make this service actually happen, seen or unseen, they have to be involved. I mean, technicians that are back there running the sound, the folks that are back in the production booth that are producing the live stream, the musicians that are leading us to praise and, and worship and, and help us prepare our hearts, the ushers that you see at the door that are greeting folks when they come in and then are, are gathering here at the front as they receive the offering, maintenance personnel, that, that makes sure that the equipment and everything around this church is operating. Sunday school teachers and Sunday school workers who have contacted people in their class throughout the week to make sure that they're okay, make sure that they're going to be here on Sunday. Church members who have invited guests and visitors to come. Office staff who are able to make everything move smoothly and keep information flowing smoothly. I mean, there's a baptism team that just helped pull all of that off that you just witnessed. And the people that have prayed without ceasing for what God would do here every week. See, I, I never want to become forgetful of all of those that Jesus uses so that he will be glorified as his word is proclaimed. It takes a lot of people, just like you see here in Nehemiah 11. He uses different people with different gifts, different skills, all for his glory to get the work done. Every person is important. And that includes you. Every task is significant. Because in some way, shape, or form, we're talking about the King of Kings being glorified. We're talking about Creator God being lifted up. We're talking about humanity bowing before Him in worship. Every task is significant. And we need not ever forget that really and truly the work and ministry of Christ is much, much larger than any one person's ministry. That's why for revival to really come to your heart, you know where it starts. Giving your whole self over to the Lord. It starts with you being willing to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Would you use me? They were to give themselves to God. But look at the second thing that I want you to notice. Not only do you, are you being told to sacrifice by giving yourself to the Lord, but secondly, you're to give your praise to the Lord. Give your praise to the Lord. What you actually have here in chapter 11 is, is Ezra and Nehemiah putting together a dedication service of this wall. And by the way, can I just tell you, it was some kind of service. <laughs> there was so much enthusiasm. There was so much excitement that verse 43 says that their shouts... And their songs were heard, you said it, afar off. Everybody could hear what was happening. And what I want you to really notice is that the emphasis here is on joyful praise. 
Can I just tell you tonight? Singing is mentioned eight times in chapter 12. Thanksgiving is mentioned six times alone in chapter 12. Rejoicing is mentioned seven times alone in chapter 12. Musical instruments of all kinds are mentioned three times in chapter 12. I'm just here to tell you, it was not your run-of-the-mill dead service. Hello. It was not. And don't ever fool yourself into thinking it was. It's not deader the service the more we glorify the king. No, it's just the opposite. The more surrendered we are, Amen. the more open we are to him. All the masks off. Just open before him. The more that the king is glorified. Here's what they did. They divided the people into two groups. Nehemiah led one. Ezra led the other. They started from the valley gate. And if you look down at verse 31 through 37, you'll see in chapter 12 what happened. In verse 31, he says, So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuse gate. After them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priest's sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, and son of Madaniah, the son of Micaniah, the son of Zechur, the son of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah, Azarel, Milalai, Gilalai, Mai, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanami with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra went before them. By the fountain gate in front of them, they went up the stairs on the city of David, on the stairway of the wall, beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastward. That was Ezra's group. They headed south. Nehemiah's group picks up in verse 38. In verse 39, they headed north. The other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way. And I was behind them with half of the people on the wall. That's where you get the phrase leading from behind. No, I'm just kidding. But he, he says, I was behind them with half of the people on the wall, going past the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall and above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate. And they stopped by the gate of the prison. In other words... One went south, one went north, and both groups met at the temple area where the service climaxed with the people bringing their sacrifices before the Lord. You say, Mark, why this kind of service? Why, why this kind of service of, of praise? Because I'm just here to tell you, the people were bearing witness to the watching world that God had done the work and he alone should be glorified. You say, well, I don't know that it was a very dignified service. Well, guess what? It wasn't their dignity that was being glorified. It was their God. And they didn't care who knew it. 
They wanted folks to know it was not about them. It was about him. Because remember, this is the same Nehemiah back in chapter 2 that said, I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me and of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And if you'll remember, I told you the reason Nehemiah just out of the blue said, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, was for this very reason. Nehemiah, listen, he was cupbearer to the king. He had the cushiest job in the world, just kind of managing the palace there. He got to eat at the king's table. He got to talk to the king. He got to make sure that nobody poisoned the king's food. He, listen, he had a great great gig going on as cupbearer to the king. But Nehemiah left all of that. Why? Because God had burdened his heart for what was happening to the city. And Nehemiah had been cupbearer to the king You can't show me any record that demonstrates Nehemiah had ever done a physical day's labor in his entire life. He just did not physical labor. He didn't have a clue how to mix mortar. He didn't have a clue how to lay a brick. He didn't have a clue how to pull a plumb line and make sure the wall was going up straight. But he did have something that nobody else seemed to have. He had the hand of God upon his life. God took the one that didn't know anything about building a wall and raised him up and equipped him to what I said earlier, do in 52 days what hadn't been able to be accomplished in 142 years. And the great news is that God of Nehemiah and that hand that was upon his life is the same hand of the same God that can be upon your life, sir, can be placed upon your life, ma'am, and you can be used of him in ways that you never imagined you could be used. They were bearing witness to all of that. And, and listen, here are all these people marching around the wall. But if I had to, if, listen, if I had to help you see one thing and understand it tonight, it would be this. Our God loves the adoration and the praise of his people. Can I just get that through your mind and into your heart? Our God loves the praise and adoration of his people. Listen, flip over to Hebrews just a minute. I'll show it to you. In Hebrews, you'll notice... In Hebrews 13, in verse 15, what does it say? It says in Hebrews 13, 15, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Wow. And then in Psalm 69, if you have, if if you flip over to Psalm 69 in the Old Testament, you notice in verse 30 and 31, these words, Psalm 69, verse 30 and 31, simply says this. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. Isn't that something? Better than anything you could 
sacrifice to him, possession-wise, the psalmist, psalmist says, Praise the name of the Lord your God with a song and magnify him with your thanksgiving. All the way through the 12th chapter, I love it because you see them offering their praise thankfully. Doesn't matter if it's verse 24, verse 27, verse 31. They're offering their praise thankfully. Then you notice they're offering their praise joyfully. Verse 27 and 43 and 44. They're offering their praise loudly in verse 42 and 43. And they're offering their praise with instruments in verse 27 and verse 35 and 36. I'm just telling you, folks, when they came to worship the Lord, they didn't come to a drib, drab funeral service. It was not a time for muted meditation, but it was a time for pulling out all the stops and praising the Lord enthusiastically. Friend, get this truth. Worship never has been, and worship never will be a spectator sport. But I've noticed many have allowed it to become just that, a spectator sport. No, it calls for your participation. It calls for your involvement. Sometimes I think people fear so much moving toward a, a more anointed, expressive style of worship. Let me just be the first to tell you here tonight. I don't believe it's ever, ever right to try and create an animated, expressive worship. I don't believe it's ever right to try to create that. But I do desire to be in a place where there is an atmosphere that is so open and so real that the Holy Spirit of God feels freely to move in our midst. That scares some people. Because they don't know what that looks like. And there's a term for you and me if we fall in that trap. Control freak. We want to be in control. We want to know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. Right. When God's in control, you and I are surrendering ourselves to his worship. And he will guide. As long as it's done in accordance with his word, you better open your mind and your heart to what he wants to do. We need to feel the freedom to praise our Lord and to worship him. And again, you see the end of verse 43 that we read. It was so powerful, it was heard afar off. You know, that's what I'm praying is going to happen that first week in April. That God's going to do something at that fairgrounds that will just be heard across the state of North Carolina. You know, they're calling it Return 2022. Wouldn't it be awesome if people all across this state begin to return to the Lord? Hey, wouldn't it just be awesome if people started returning to church? Again, hello. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something new and exciting? If people just started returning to church after our two years hiatus that the nation has seemed to take. The final thing, I'll leave you with this. 
is a sacrifice they were told was to give your gifts to God. Give your gifts to God. If you go back two pages to chapter 10, I want you to look at verse 32 through 39. And you begin to see what the covenant was. In verse 32 through 39 of chapter 10, said, Alway also we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbath, the new moons and set feasts, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and all the work of of the house of our God. We cast lots among the priests and Levites and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God according to our father's houses at the appointed times year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord. To bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God. To the priests who minister in the house of our God. To bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil. To the priests to the storerooms of the house of our God and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities and the priests the descendant of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God to the rooms of the storehouse for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain of the new wine and the oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and gatekeepers and singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. You see, they covenanted signed it, wrote it down, and signed it that they were going to support the temple ministry. And the bottom line is, they kept their promises. They kept their word. And the people brought their tithes and offerings not only because God commanded it, but when I flipped over to verse 44, of chapter 12, where we stopped right before we read it tonight, it says, And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings of the first fruits and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. In other words, it tells us that they were pleased with the ministering priests and the Levites. And bottom line is that the people saw in the spiritual leaders somebody that was willing to be an example. An exemplary leader in their personal walk with the Lord. You see, I, I never can ask you to do one single thing that I'm not willing to do myself. I just can't. It'd be wrong. Not only because it's leadership, but because it would just be wrong to expect of others that which you're not willing to do yourself. You see, tonight, I just want you to understand when God gives you an opportunity to be a part of a church family that really does want to exalt Jesus, that really does teach the Word of the living God, and really does want to reach out to people, we should be only too glad. 
to bring our tithes into the storehouse. That that work of God may go forth. I'm just telling you, it was a high and holy day in Jerusalem. People were giving themselves to God. Giving themselves to God. Are you? People were giving their praises to God. They were consumed with it. Are you? They were giving their offerings, their resources to God in obedience. Are, are you? I'll tell you, there's a special revival that broke out in Jerusalem when the people began to do exactly what the Word had said. Would you bow your heads right where you are, please? Father, how we long, how we long for a spiritual awakening in this area called Mooresville, North Carolina. Lord, how we long for an awakening across our state of North Carolina. And Lord, how we long for a real spiritual awakening to take place in our nation. Lord, we recognize the the very things that were precious to us as we grew up are becoming lost on an entire generation of children and young people. And Father, we just need to hear you. And we need as families once again to step up to the plate. And we need to make the covenant with you. We need to fulfill the plans and purposes that you have for us as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents. That it will not be lost on an entire generation. The priorities and truths that you desire for our homes and for our communities across this nation. Lord, I pray that as you do bring a revival, and I, I'm praying in faith, believing you are going to do this in the weeks, in the months, in the years ahead. Father, I pray that right here in Iredell County, right here on Urban Road, that, Lord, there would be a marker that we'd be able to just place before us tonight. Remembering the time when we made a commitment to say, here I stand, Lord. Here I stand. And I need you. I need you. Lord, use me. Use me for your amazing purposes and your amazing plan. Please. Use me, O oh Lord. Tonight, if you're here and you've never received Christ, I invite you to come tonight. All you got to do is just say to me, preacher, I need Jesus. That's all you got to say. Give me the opportunity to talk with you and pray with you here at the altar. You can make that commitment to Christ tonight to follow him. You may be here and you're already a believer, but maybe you've not got a church home right now or you're seeking and, 
and God's leading you here. Maybe you've been visiting for several weeks or some time and, and God's just continuing to press on your heart of where you need to be. And if that place is right here at Trinity Baptist, I invite you to come tonight and say, hey, put my name down. <laughs> I want to be on the list. Just like all those were listed there in Nehemiah. I want to be part of this family. And we'll receive you in whatever way we receive members tonight. Or maybe just get alone with God on this altar. It's open. And you can just come to him and say, here I am, Lord. Take me. Take me as I am. And use me to your glory. Father, thank you for casting a vision tonight of what happened in that dedication service on that wall that was built for your glory. And God, let us simply be tools in your hands to be a part of another great awakening in our land in 2022. Father, we hunger, we thirst for it. And we ask you to grant it so in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet?